What impact did the Yamnaya culture, the Viking Age and various other episodes down through history have on the genetics of Denmark? Now, people with Danish ancestry are found across the world, notably in the US, Canada, Brazil and Australia. The word Denmark comes from two main elements. The first is Dan, which is thought to be a reference to the Danes. An ancient North Germanic tribe whose name probably ultimately comes from an early Germanic word meaning flat land. One of the earliest legendary kings of the Danes was also called Dan or Half Dan. The second element is Mark, which in Old Norse and Old Germanic languages means borderland or marsh. So Denmark essentially means the borderland of the Danes. Now, although Greenland and the Faroe Islands are autonomous territories of Denmark, I am going to focus on Denmark proper in this video and leave the other two for future videos. Now, the earliest inhabitants of Denmark arrived after the ice receded around 12,000 years ago. A really interesting study published in Nature earlier this year looked at the ancient genetic history of Denmark. This study analysed 100 skeletons in Denmark spanning 7,300 years through the Mesolithic period, the Neolithic period as well as the Early Bronze Age. Now this study gives a really good overview of the ancient genetics of Denmark and how the genetics have changed over time. They first note that the Danish Mesolithic individuals of the Maglamus, Congamus and the Erbelu cultures form a distinct genetic cluster related to other Western European hunter-gatherers. Despite shifts in material culture, they displayed genetic homogeneity from around 10,500 to 5,900 calibrated years before present, when Neolithic farmers with Anatolian-derived ancestry arrived. Now, the arrival of these first farmers was very abrupt and resulted in a population turnover with limited genetic contribution from local hunter-gatherers moving forward. The succeeding Neolithic population, associated with the Funnel Beaker culture, persisted for only about 1,000 years, however, before immigrants with Eastern steppe-derived ancestry arrived. This second and equally rapid population replacement gave rise to the single grave culture, with an ancestry profile more similar to present day Danes. Now, the single grave culture is worth noting in a little more detail. It existed from around 2800 to 2200 BC in North Central Europe, and it was characterised by the practice of single burial, with the deceased usually accompanied by a battle axe, amber beads and pottery vessels. The single grave complex was an offshoot of the broader Cordedware culture, which itself was connected to the Yamnaya culture of the Pontic Caspian steppe. A 2021 study published in PILOS analysed the genetics of five skeletons from the single grave culture in Denmark. But what did the genetics of these ancient people look like? Well, unfortunately, the DNA preservation was actually quite poor, and the study only managed to sequence the genome, fully sequence the genome of one individual, and partially sequence another two individuals. So basically, there was three that were either partially or fully um, sequenced. But basically, what they found is that these people were genetically very similar to the corded bear culture in general, and they can be seen as a northern branch of the corded bear culture genetically with these people having significant step DNA. The study, however, notes that these single grave people did not wipe out the previous people of Denmark, but rather mixed with them. The authors add that these three single grave people carry a close genetic resemblance to individuals from other Cordedware culture-derived cultures, such as the Swedish Batowax individuals, Unitice individuals from Poland, and five previously analysed late Neolithic, early Bronze Age individuals from Denmark. But what haplogroups did these ancient people belong to? Well, this table shows the breakdown of their genetics. The top person in this table was a female who belonged to the mitochondrial DNA haplogroup HV0. The other two were men that belonged to K2A on the mitochondrial side, with one of the men belonging to R1B1 on the Y-DNA side. The other male's Y-DNA haplogroup couldn't be established because of the poor preservation, unfortunately. An interesting point the study notes relates to the mitochondrial haplogroups of these individuals and how they speak to the nature of the migrations from the steppe. As the author writes, These haplogroups are part of the Neolithic package that became common in Europe following the Neolithic transition and the K2 subgroup has previously been observed both among subsequent corded ware and bell beakers from England. This has often been interpreted as continuity in the female gene pool, suggesting that the incoming corded bear culture related migrants were largely males, and then local females were brought in. 
Our mitochondrial DNA results from the get out grave are not inconsistent with this notion. So the step component was the third major component in ancient genetics of Denmark and this seemed to be a male dominated migration. And in fact, other studies have painted a similar picture of this male dominated migration from the step. A 2017 study published in PNAS supports this idea for instance, as they found no evidence of a sex bias during the migration of the first farmers from Anatolia. But for later migrations from the Pontic steppe during the late Neolithic Bronze Age, however, we estimate a dramatic male bias, with approximately 5 to 14 migrating males for every migrating female. We find evidence of ongoing, primarily male, migration from the steppe to Central Europe over a period of multiple generations. But what about later episodes in the genetic history of Denmark? Well, during the Iron Age, Denmark actually shows, or the ancient land, the land we call Denmark today, shows relative genetic stability during the Iron Age, with no major migrations compared to the previous waves during the Neolithic and during the Bronze Age. However, there was ongoing interactions with neighbouring populations, particularly from Germany and Central Europe. This period also saw the rise of powerful tribal societies in Denmark, including the Cimbri and Teutones, who are mentioned in Roman historical sources. These tribes are famous for fighting the Cimbrian War against the Roman Republic, with these peoples migrating from the Jutland Peninsula into Roman-controlled territory, clashing with Rome and her allies. It resulted in a Roman victory, however. Now, the next major change in the genetics of Denmark was during the most famous period in the history of the country, the Viking Age, of course. But how did the genetics of Denmark change during this time? Well, a 2020 study published in Nature that analysed the population genomics of the Viking world found that there was an inflow of South European ancestry into Denmark, with several individuals from Denmark having large amounts of this ancestry from Southern Europe. Exactly why this was the case wasn't addressed in this study, but it was probably due to trading links and perhaps the slave trade as well. Given Denmark's geography, i.e. located in southern Scandinavia, it would have been the site of lots of mixing of different peoples compared to northern parts of Scandinavia during the Viking Age. We also know that there was a gene flow from Britain and Ireland into Denmark during this time. This was probably a reflection of slaves being brought back into Scandinavia, as well as voluntary migrations of, say, Christian missionaries, for example. Although the majority of this inflow from Britain and Ireland was during the Viking Age, there was earlier exceptions to this. A 2023 study, for instance, published in Cell, that looked at the genetic history of Scandinavia from the Roman Iron Age to the present, analysed a young female from Denmark who was dated to the 5th century AD and who had nearly full British-Irish ancestry. The author suggested she could have ended up in Denmark as an indirect consequence of the Anglo-Saxon migration to the British Isles. But what about later episodes in the genetic history of Denmark? Well, there has obviously been various instances of mixing between the different Scandinavian populations over time as well, and various unions in this area have helped this. There was the Kalmar Union, for example, that existed from 1397 to 1523, a union that included the Scandinavian powers as well as other territories such as Orkney and Shetland for a period. Between the 16th and 19th century, Denmark was also in a union with Norway as well as other northern countries such as Iceland. There has also been a reasonable amount of mixing over time with parts of northern Europe such as Germany and the Netherlands. A 2016 study published in Genetics that analysed the genetic structure of Denmark also found some evidence of a Polish admixture signal in the provinces of Zeeland and Funen, with the date of this admixture coinciding with historical evidence of Wen settlements in the south of Denmark. Wens is the name used for a number of historic Slavic peoples who inhabited the area in modern northeast Germany. Now let's look at who the Danes are genetically closest to, what is the genetic structure of Denmark in general, and what haplogroups are common in the country today. Well, this 2016 study that looked at the genetic structure of Denmark analysed 800 high school students from across the country. It found that Denmark in general has remarkable genetic homogeneity, with no major divisions such as a north-south split that we see in other countries such as the Netherlands. It also found that the country has a genetic affinity with Britain, Sweden, Norway, Germany and France. 
Although genetically closest to Sweden and Norway, one major difference in Denmark is the relative lack of Uralic ancestry compared to other parts of Scandinavia. As northern parts of both Sweden and Norway have this Uralic component largely due to the Sami presence as I go through in previous videos. But what about haplogroups? Well, the two most common Y-DNA haplogroups in Denmark are R1b and I1. With both making up around 35% of the population, although estimates vary slightly. R1b is associated with the migrations from the Pontic Caspian steppe during the Bronze Age, connected to the Yamnaya. I1 is very common in other parts of Scandinavia in general, although its origins aren't 100% clear. Some say it is indigenous to Europe and likely developed amongst the hunter gatherer populations of Northern Europe during the Paleolithic period, over 20,000 years ago. R1A is also found in Denmark, although at lower levels, with I2 amongst the other Y-DNA haplogroups found in the country. On the maternal side, H is the most common mitochondrial haplogroup in Denmark, similar to various other parts of Europe. H is believed to have originated in the Near East around 25,000 years ago, and its movement into Europe seems to have been through various waves, although there is some debate around this. A general picture can still be painted though. Around 20,000 years ago, during the last glacial maximum, many carrying haplogroup H are thought to have moved into southern Europe, particularly into Iberia, Italy and the Balkans. As the glaciers began to recede approximately 15,000 to 10,000 years ago, these groups expanded northward and eastward, bringing haplogroup H into much of western and central Europe. This haplogroup then saw a major increase in Europe when the first farmers from the Near East swept across Europe, increasing its frequency. Other mitochondrial haplogroups found in Denmark include K and U, amongst others. So as we have seen, Denmark has a fascinating genetic history that connects steppe ancestry to gene flow from Britain and Ireland and southern Europe during the Viking Age. But what is the genetic history of a country just north of Denmark, Norway? To find out, please click here. Thanks for watching, please subscribe and hit the bell, and let me know your thoughts in the comments below. If you would like to vote on what video topics I make videos on, please check out my Patreon page, I'll put a link below. Um, but yeah, thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next time.